Hi, it's Justin from Spalted Sag Studio. In this video, I'm going to make a humidor or a stash box, depending on what state you live in. Most of the box will be made out of a single piece of walnut. I already split the walnut to separate the sides from the top. The sides are going to be infinity edge and the top will be a book match. Both of them are a very similar process and it starts by splitting it down the center. And when you do this, you want to make sure you're really accurate with your bandsaw. You don't want to take off too much material from the center. If you do, it's not going to match up properly. Over at the planer, I'm going to be taking minimal amounts off. This is very figured wood and even though I have helical head, I want to be sure that I'm not getting any kind of tear out. Like I said, if you take off too much material, it's not going to line up properly. This beautiful piece of walnut is going to be for the book match top. Now I always make a mark from my off cut side, that way I don't get turned around. It's pretty obvious by looking at it, but nonetheless, always make a mark. Things happen and you don't want to make a mistake and ruin this project. I'll use my handy dandy false fence and make sure I'm cutting these to the exact same size. As always, I give it a finishing touch with my hand plane. Now this is nice because if you're off a little bit, obviously that's drastic, but it's going to compensate for it. So when you put it together, it'll still be nice and flat and you're going to have a almost invisible glue line. For the glue up, I probably should have used dominoes, but since this material is pretty thin, it's a little under half an inch, I really didn't want to mess with it. The calls work fine, it's, it's going to get it nice and flat. The only thing I have to worry about is the alignment side to side. As long as you take your time, line everything up, it'll be fine. You don't want any shifting though because any side to side movement is going to make the book matching look weird. For the infinity edge, I'm going to start by measuring the long side, plus an eighth, and then plus the short side. I also have the two pieces taped together so I get a perfect cut. Once you get it cut down to size, you can see that on either side the grain will continue. And that's how you get it to continue on all four sides, as opposed to just three if you used a single piece of four quarter material. I'll start by measuring the short side and then I'll skip an eighth inch and that's for the saw blade and then the remaining should be the long side. I'm using a pica here and I was just trying to do that so it's visible to you guys but I wasn't getting the accuracy so I had to switch to a pencil. I just check and make sure my long side matches up to my plans and it does so we'll move on to the second part. And we'll do the same thing on this side starting with the short side and ending with the long side. Now that we've got these all cut down to size, I went ahead and labeled each joint and you'll see that joint one will line up perfectly. The grain continues right through it as does with joint four. So this accomplishes an infinity edge. We have four good looking joints. I prepared some Spanish cedar and planed that down to the appropriate thickness. And I'm just doing this now because I want to make sure that I get tight fitting dados for the base. I'm looking at about a quarter inch depth on the dados so I'll use a setup block for that and then get started on the tedious process of cutting dados. To start I'll normally move the fence up just under an eighth inch between each pass. But once I get close to the final width of the dado, I'll barely move it and walk it till it fits nice and snugly. Once we get the dados cut, we'll go ahead and cut the miters. I'm using my digital gauge and referencing my sled, and then just checking to ensure that my blade is at 45 degrees. I'm going to double side tape a scrap piece of wood to my fence. The sled is kind of old so it's taking some abuse and I'll make a kerf on that scrap piece 
and this will ensure that I get a very accurate cut. We don't want to take any material off from the outside because then our grain will not line up properly. Once I get everything cut down to the appropriate size, I'll use some blue tape, get everything taped together, and then I'll get some accurate measurements for the rabbits for the top and what size to cut the Spanish cedar base. This will also give me a nice preview for the Infinity Edge, which I won't share because you need to be patient. Now that I got my measurements, I went ahead and cut the top to size, and now I'll do my rabbits. Again, I'm going about a quarter inch deep. It's a little less than that, actually. And then just taking my time going around this to ensure that I get a nice, tight fit. So again, I'll use some blue tape and get everything ready to glue up. Now, I like to pre-saturate my end grain with glue. So I'll apply a little let it sit for about five minutes and you'll notice that the end grain sucks it in and the thought is that once it does that it'll clog the end grain and give something for the next layer of glue to adhere to so we'll go ahead and apply the next layer and we really don't need to focus too much on the strength of the miters i'll be using some splines to give it some strength but it does help so I'm taking the blue tape off because I seen some of it get folded into the grain, which just means I didn't have it tight enough when I pre-assembled it. Other than that, this glue up went surprisingly well. The strap clamps make gluing miters together very, very easy, though sometimes they do slip a little bit, but with a little finesse, they'll work great. I'll set my saw blade up for a quarter inch depth and this is going to be to cut the rabbits for the leopard wood inlays that will go along the top of the humidor. I went ahead and cut some strips of leopard wood and I'll start by cutting a miter on one, placing my second one and then just using a marking knife to mark the inner part of the miter. And this will make sure you get a nice tight fitting miter on these, even if you're a little off on your squareness of your box. So once I do that, I'll go ahead and tape everything down, make sure everything's nice and tight, and then I'll label each piece of leopard wood to the box so I don't get mixed up. Now I really didn't need to label them because I never actually took it off the box once I taped them on there to double check everything. Gluing, it's a nice simple glue up as long as you don't move anything around but it's going to take a lot of clamps. I'm pretty sure I used every clamp that I have and that's just because you're trying to apply pressure in two different directions and you got kind of a long distance to do that in. So not only do I have to push these down into the box but I have to push it across into the top as well. And that's almost more important because you're going to see that more than you would on the sides. So just make sure you use plenty of clamps, get everything nice and tight, and then let that sit overnight. Now that I got everything glued together, I'll use a flush trim bit and get everything nice and even with the walnut. Now leopard wood is a little hard to work with on this it does like to tear out I could do a climb cut but I really didn't want to risk that so I just went ahead and took my time with this I taped a false fence down to my spline jig and since the top splines will be the same distance as the bottom splines I didn't have to move the fence here then once I went to cut the third splines I just lined everything up and moved my fence and made those cuts I used some scrap mahogany to make the splines and I was hoping that it would have a similar look to the leopard wood once it was finished but it ended up being significantly darker so I kind of wish I would have stuck with the leopard wood. I also made them a little too thin it wasn't much a couple thousandths but it didn't sit as tight as I wanted to so I just applied a little more glue and it worked just fine.
I'll go ahead and mark out the path for the lid. Originally I was going to do this on the table saw, but I was off a little on my math and I didn't like the look of it, so I'm just gonna move it over to the bandsaw. It's no big deal. I was a little worried about this. I've never actually cut the lid off on the bandsaw before. I've always used a table saw. But I'm actually glad I did. For one, it's a lot safer to do this. And for two, it came out surprisingly better than it would have on the table saw. I had nice, smooth edges, and I had to do very little work to get everything flat. The vertical cuts were insanely smooth. I couldn't believe it. it was like a hand plane. The horizontal cuts, not so much. They didn't need a little work, but still not as much as that would have needed on a table saw. Using a hand plane, I'll touch everything up. And I'm taking off as little material as the hand plane allow me. And I'm counting my strokes to make sure that I take off the same amount from each side. If I take off a little too much, you're going to notice it when the lid closes. Of your corners, because those are going to get hit twice. So on the second pass, I let up on the handle when I'm in the corner so it doesn't take off material. Then I'll use a straight edge, make sure everything's nice and flat, take off material as I need it until I get a nice flat surface. We need to line the interior of this box with Spanish cedar. Almost all humidors are going to do this, and that's because the Spanish cedar is really good at controlling the moisture. It also is resistant to any kind of rot, it doesn't move that much, and it has some other benefits that really make it the prime wood for humidors. Now personally, I don't really like working with it. The dust has a weird smell to it, it's almost rubbery, and I always end up with some dust in my mouth somehow and it tastes like I'm chewing on a rubber band. So I don't really like working with it, but it is a necessity for this project. And for the glue up, we need to be really careful that we don't get squeezed out. If it got on the sides, it would be one thing. You still have a flat surface to reference your chisel on and scrape it off. But if it gets on the bottom, you don't have that surface. And the Spanish cedar is really, really soft. So your chisel is going to want to dig in glue heavy in the center and then very very light near the bottom and the top. Now if I do get squeezed out on the top it's not too big of a deal because I do still have that flat surface on the top to clean it up with a chisel. Once we get the sides all glued and inserted, calm down, we'll get it clamped together. Now when we do this we want to put some wood in there to clamp it down with. And that's just to increase the surface area because this Spanish cedar is really soft. So if you don't increase that area, you're going to end up denting it and it's going to be really hard to fix that. And honestly, I didn't really didn't think about it until I actually had things glued. So I had to rush around and find wood that would work. So just make sure you're more prepared than me and have that ready and do some mock glue ups before you actually put some glue on. Again, this is a situation where you're going to need plenty of clamps. There's quite a bit of surface area that you're clamping down and since that Spanish cedar is soft and kind of thin, it's flexible and that's going to allow it to bow in spots. So you just want to make sure you're applying a fair amount of pressure along the whole surface area. Off camera, I used my block plane and put a slight chamfer on the Spanish cedar. And I did this just to help guide the lid down and make sure that I get a nice tight fit without it binding. Starting the layout for the hinges, I'll mark from each side, dropping my tape in the process. Once I get those marks made, I'll use my square so that way I get a nice perpendicular line. Then I'll tape down the hinge using some double sided tape and go along the edges with a marking knife. Now I really don't like this tape that I'm using. It's like malleable so it moves on me a lot. But for this it worked okay. But I do need to get some better stuff in the future. I use my square to mark the depth of the hinges. And then I'll use that as a guide and use the marking knife again. Cutting depth. Now I'll remove most of the material with the chisels. But once I get close I'll use my router plane to make sure that I don't take off too much. And I get a nice flat surface for the hinges to sit on. You 
using my router plane. I'm just taking light passes, slowly walking up to that line. And I'm also checking it with the actual hinge until I get a nice flush fit. Again, you want to take off minimal amounts when you're doing this. If you take off too much, it's going to be a difficult fix. Once I get the lower portion cut, I use my square and line everything up and cut the top using the same exact process. Once I get the hinges all cut out, I'll go ahead and give it a light sanding, make sure everything's nice and flush. I'm also checking to make sure that my hinges are even. And then once I'm done with this, I will take it down into the spray booth and start the lacquering process. I'll be wet sanding this to a nice glossy finish. I'm only doing it on the top and that just brings out the book matching. So I had to apply a significant amount of lacquer. I think I did between 15 and 16 coats. I did sand it twice in between there intermittently just to make sure that I was keeping flat. If you don't apply quite a bit, you're gonna end up sanding through, especially on your edges. So you need to be real careful when you're doing this and not accidentally tilt one way or another when you get close to your edge. If you do, you may have to start over completely. Since we're buffing this out to a sheen, sometimes you can see like witness layers. So if you sand through and then take it back down and apply more lacquer, you might be able to see it slightly. And I'm always kind of iffy about wet sanding the lacquer. I just prefer not to, but the lacquer, even after curing it, likes to clog the sandpaper, so I really don't have a choice. So I started with 600 grit. I moved all the way to 2000 grit and then I shifted to the buffing compounds. I'm also making sure to wipe everything off in between each grit. You don't want any remaining residue left over from the previous grit because you'll end up with swirls. So again, take your time, even more so on the buffing. It's a lot easier to accidentally roll over your edges when you have something squishy beneath you. Take your time, make sure you're not going too heavy on your edges and really be careful to any swirl marks. If you have them, you won't really notice them until your last step. If you look slightly at angles, you will pick them up though. So just make sure you're paying attention and taking your time. It is imperative to take your time on this. Okay, there's a nice fancy box that you can put your we I mean cigars in. To keep everything nice and moist. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe.